So thank you very much, Greg and Joao, for having me here. It's uh, really exciting and a pleasure to, to speak at this WIRED event. Um, as, as Greg said, um, together with Aviv Regev of the Broad Institute, I set out about uh, two, two years ago or so to um, found a community to be able to map all the, the cells and tissues in the human body at the level of single cell resolution. And so that we dubbed that the Human Cell Atlas Consortium, or the, the Human Cell Atlas Effort. And I want to give you an idea of the, the journey that we've been on over the past 18 months or so uh, in, in the next 15 minutes. So the, the idea of the Human Cell Atlas is to describe and discover the cells in our body using high throughput technologies that I'll talk about a little bit and um, to drill down to a, a very high resolution view of cells and tissues. So it's to create a human reference map of the, the properties of our cells in, in, in our tissues. And we think that this will have a, a fundamental impact on diagnosis, monitoring, and treating health and disease. So um, you're all familiar with uh, studying cells by microscopy, and indeed this was the way cells were sort of described and discovered in the first place. And imaging has been incredibly powerful in understanding the structures and also expression of genes and proteins in our cells. And it's led to a, an idea that there may be a few hundred cell types in the body, and in, in some areas in neuroscience and immunology, there are sort of more fine-grained um, um, descriptions of cells. Now, what we'd like to do is to use these two, two different types of technologies, single cell genomics, single cell RNA sequencing is what I'm showing here um, on the slide, and spatial gene expression methods to define the cells in tissues. And, um, and so the, the concept is that we want to go from a rougher sort of um, Google countries or continents view to this street maps view, where you can see my, my, um, my first house in Cambridge there at, at sort of very high resolution. And if we uh, sort of take this, this new technology of single cell genomics that's, that's basically developed in, in, a, in a, a very large accessible way over the past, say, almost 10 years now, um, and, and sort of extrapolate this to its ultimate kind of conclusion, then we can hope to get a high resolution view of all the cells and tissues. And really the excitement about single cell genomics and also spatial gene expression genomics technologies is that we can now move from having this bulk genomics view of cells where we measure the, the genes that are expressed, the transcriptomes, using hundreds of thousands of cells as input. So it's sort of the fruit smoothie here where you're basically blending thousands of cells to measure the, the gene expression values to actually drilling down to individual cells and profiling each, each single cell in your fruit salad. And also combining that with using sections of the tissues to reconstruct the, the neighborhood of the cells within the tissue in a two or three dimensional way. So really this, this, this resolution revolution in genomics going from the, 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 the view of the fruit salad by, by blending the, the single cells to the single cell view has, has absolutely, absolutely you know, changed things in, in, in the way we can access single cells at the genomics level. So just to sort of say, if we have a cell sample, we need to um, get at the single cells and we can then um, profile them at the single cell level so that we get an unbiased view and just using data mining, we can define how many cell types there are, the frequency of each cell type, and it's completely unbiased. And it's really this, this technology and this resolution revolution in genomics to the single cell level that's um, galvanize the community and, and to, to, to move forward in this quest to build a human cell atlas. So what you can see here is an overview of the different um, cell capture technologies across the top, um, basically, that have, have all evolved over the past less than 10 years. And their, their cells have, have gone from being trapped manually in an extremely laborious way to multiplexing in well plates through to microfluidic chips and, and droplets, microfluidic droplets are one of the major technologies now, as well as my, micro sort of pico wells and, and then barcoding approaches. And what that's meant along with advances in the genomics technologies and cheaper sequencing and so on, is that in a single experiment we can now go from profiling a handful of cells, as you can see sort of at the, 
at the beginning of the, the, time, the time chart, all the way now to, to really um, looking at hundreds of thousands or even millions of cells in a single experiment. And of course, that, that's a real game changer. Um, what we also want to know is not just the, the profile of each single cell in a genome-wide unbiased way, but as I said, also how, those, how the cells sit with their neighbors inside tissues to understand the, the interaction between the cells and the tissue architecture. And for that, there are now, on the one hand, high-throughput imaging technologies, and on the other hand, spatial transcriptomics technologies, for instance, from the spatialtranscriptomics.com chips, where we can uh, profile the transcriptome in 100 micron resolutions of 100 micron voxels, as indicated in this breast cancer tissue slide, and then um, essentially reconstruct the sort of topography of the gene expression landscape of that tissue section. And then using computational methods, and this is um, basically work that's uh, just gone online from my group, we can, um, we can then interpret that, that uh, um, gene expression landscape and basically define the, the regions of the landscape, the regions of that breast cancer tissue section where the genes are variable and what are the, the clusters of voxels essentially that have, that have the same expression patterns. And so you can, you can see sort of by integrating the, the expression at the single cell level with these spatial information, you, you start to reconstruct the, the, the tissue architecture in a very, very high resolution way. So um, these are, that's, that's basically all I'm gonna say about the technologies to sort of give you an overview of what's sort of galvanizing the, the field and what's, what's uh, catalyzing the idea that this crazy quest could actually be possible and um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the community that sort of gathered and snowballed over the past 18 months to set out on this quest together. And it's, it's growing all the time and new people are joining. So about 18 months ago, we had a, a kickoff meeting here in London, just down the road at the Wellcome Trust headquarters. And um, that, that was the first gathering of the community around this, this, um, this idea. We've then had a, a, a number of meetings to, to, to focus on technologies, to focus on the computational methods. You can see that this is an incredibly interdisciplinary project where we need to have um, biomedical specialists on board for the different tissues. We need to have technology experts, genome biologists, computational biologists like myself and so on, who are, um, who are on board and working together. And now we're, at this point, really starting to get into a data gathering phase. And just last week, we had an incredibly exciting meeting on the Genome Campus in Cambridge, where we've had glimpses of the first data sets that are being generated on different tissues. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit, a bit about um, some of the results at the end. So this is an, an incredibly um, exciting interdisciplinary disciplinary community. Almost 500 scientists have signed up in our registry as participants. They come from 44 different countries. 185 different projects are, are registered um, across 22 different tissues. And you can see this ranges from um, many different tissues in adult through to pediatric and development. Um, we are really committed to, to making this an open project and that includes sharing our protocols on protocols.io, having a, a data coordination platform um, and that's been generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative where we, we publish our data in an open access way and this, this um, organization of the data in this platform is occurring basically uh, at, at different sites around the world. UCSC, EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute here on the Genome Campus in Cambridge, the Broad Institute in Boston and the Trans Zuckerberg Initiative. And um, you can see the, the members met last week in Hingston. It's a large uh, group of developers who are working on this data coordination platform. This shows you the sort of geographic spread, basically, of, of participants. And here are some, some links in case you're interested in, in more information. As I mentioned, we have a registry for, for individual participants and also projects, the protocols.io, and also a Slack for discussion. I'm going to finish um, by just sharing a couple of uh, uh, results with you that, I'm, that are hot off the press that I'm particularly excited about. Um, that, that my group is involved in. And one is uh, a comparison of the upper airways, so the, the bronchi of healthy versus asthmatic donors. And the point I want to make here is that, that the Human Cell Atlas vision is to create a, a reference framework of healthy tissues. 
And that provides the foundation then for comparison to all the disease states, some of which we've heard of in, about in the previous talk. And, and that, that comparison can be tremendously powerful in showing us what are the changes that occur in disease and at different stages of disease. So um, in, in the immune system, but also in the actual tissue structure and so on, for instance, in the asthmatic lung. And the way we get this, there are different ways that we acquire tissue in human cell atlas projects. Bronchoscopies is one example. This is obviously from, from uh, people who are living and generously donating their tissue. And here the, the, uh, the biopsy is taken basically through the mouth and then pinched off through the, the third to the fifth generation, basically where the airways are dividing. So these are the upper airways. A chunk of tissue about two to five millimeters squared is, is taken out. And then um, with our collaborators in Holland and Groningen, the, the tissue is then disaggregated and uh, either total cells are profiled or the cells can be sorted to focus on particular immune cell populations. For instance, in this case, asthma is a type two immune disease and we've been particularly interested in T cells. And um, so, so here we've looked at sort of mini cohorts uh, of about 10 healthy and 10 asthmatic donors. And this is, uh, without going to too much sort of t detail into the scientific results, this shows you that we have um, overlaps between, these are single cells projected, the, the transcriptome, so sort of 6,000 dimensional measurements are projected into a 2D space. And this is showing you that the, the cells from different donors are overlapping. So there's inter-individual variation that we get, but basically the global uh, sort of picture is recapitulated in different donors. And um, we can, if we look at the difference between the asthmatic and the healthy donors, you can see that there, there is some segmentation. And, and that's the difference between the red and the, the blue cells. Now, I'm not going into the, the, the molecules and the cells in detail, but what's really interesting is that we can see um, basically shifts in both the, the basic epithelial cell populations of the lung. And we can also see um, the, the, the disease sort of pulling in different immune cell states, both from the, the innate immune system mast cells and the adaptive immune system T cells. And we can actually capture these very rare tissue resident populations that haven't actually been discovered or described before. We can see um, type, the type two T cells in the human lung kind of at, at this depth for the first time. And it's, it's basically huge, huge potential for also, um, uh, you know, new, new targets for drug, de drug development, basically. So just to summarize the shifts here, we see um, uh, shifts to a small extent in, in uh, the epithelial populations, but also in immune and sort of stromal populations, fibroblast populations. I want to give you a, a second small vignette on human development. And um, this is something that, that I'm particularly excited about and that I'd wanted to, to study for years. And the opportunity then came up to work with a collaborator in Newcastle, Mas Hanifa, and the Human Developmental Biology Repository, in, um, which is actually has an, a branch down here at UCL and also in Newcastle. And our, our, this is work that we do with our collaborators in Newcastle and also Ashley Moffat uh, in Cambridge. And um, what we are able to acquire here is material from uh, social terminations where we get this very early first trimester pregnancy placenta and also the decidua. The decidua is the, um, the, what, what is the endometrium in the non-pregnant state and then becomes this interface with the, the fetal cells, so the paternal antigens, the, the foreign, essentially, in an al it, there's an analogy to cancer uh, where we heard before that the cancer you know, has this... Uh, uh, some of the, the, the genome of itself, but there are also neoantigens. In this case, the, the fetal cells that are in green here in the placenta contain, of course, 50% of the maternal genome, but also 50% of the paternal. And so these, these antigens should be, in a normal immune context, recognized as foreign, but the decidua somehow has to adapt and tolerate the, these foreign antigens, and it also has to uh, re, remodel itself and uh, vascularize and provide... Um, access to, 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 to blood and nutrients and so on to the fetus. And what you can see here is a very rough overview of profiling this, this maternal fetal interface at single cell resolution. This is over 45,000 cells. And it's a mixture of the, the placental cells. And we, we uh, discover a new pr uh, sort of stem cell progenitor state in these placental cells that, that um, has been, uh, is, is different from the, the mouse 
other the, the rodent models that have been studied, and and so that so that's uh, particularly exciting and interesting. It's something that you don't see in the later sort of a term placenta, for instance, because by that point they've gone. We also see novel cell states. You can see three NK cell states. So NK cells, natural killer cells, were mentioned, um, and they are they are very particular deciduous NK cells, and we can, we can identify different sort of um, personalities that these cells are, are present in that weren't appreciated before. And, um, and, and also many new stromal cell types that we, we think are, are contributing to this immunotolerant environment. And um, with that, I will finish, and thank you for your attention.